Welcome. Welcome to this Wednesday evening talk and uh, we're going to look uh, today at Genesis 3 and what we know is the fall, uh, which is what happened right after creation and creation is what we looked at last time. There's a video uh, on that uh, if, you, uh, if you missed it. Um, but before I think about the fall, I came across these words by John Calvin, which I think helps to put everything into perspective. And this is what he said, Humanity never achieves a clear knowledge of itself unless it has first looked upon God's face and then descends from contemplating him to scrutinising itself. That's about you, but I love that picture that only when we gaze uh, at God, at the glory of God, uh, only when we look at his face will we see ourselves correctly. Uh, only if we start by looking at God first will we understand ourselves. And, and I don't know about you, but when we look around the world and the wars uh, and the heartaches uh, and the famines and even in this pandemic, there's the selfishness that we've seen of humanity day after day, pictures of people ignoring social distancing, whether on beaches or parking illegally to climb mountains. Um, we see so much of the selfish culture around us that people are very much looking at themselves uh, and not looking at God at all. And what we see there in many ways is what we see uh, because of Genesis 3. If you remember, we looked at uh, creation, uh, we looked at how God made us, uh, that God has created us to enjoy him, to live uh, for his glory, to live in relationship with him, uh, and to be his image bearers. Um, but the Bible also makes clear that we're not some um, product of some incredibly chance cosmic process. God is our creator. But as you look through the creation story, it starts with the, the kind of big picture stuff, the huge stuff going on, but then it focuses right in on humanity. And we see God doing uh, two things. He forms Adam from the ground, and then he breathes into uh, his nostrils the breath of life. And we see that Adam then becomes a living being, and we see that he's a physical being, but also a spiritual being. And what happens is that from that beautiful picture of creation in Genesis 1 and 2, uh, of harmony, of walking with God in the garden, suddenly they're expelled from the garden. And that's because of the fall that takes place. And sin is the reason. And sin's a word we use a lot and it covers a lot of different things. If I just go through some of the some of the words the Bible uses for sin and, and the meaning, I'm just going to look at the meaning. Sin means missing the mark, an act of rebellion, a trespass or a transgression. It means a going astray, a failure, a fault, a wrongdoing, a breach of the law. It also uses words like unrighteousness and lawlessness and godlessness, seems to end with an S, uh, or simply a moral stumble. But the main characteristic of sin is that ultimately it's against God. Obviously, people get caught up in sin too, uh, and it affects others, but ultimately every sin is a sin against God. And Psalm 51 verse 4 says, Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And in Genesis 1 and 2, we've seen God give Adam and Eve so much freedom, so much scope, so much potential, um, so much joy and peace and love, but the devil walks into the garden uh, or comes into the garden uh, as the serpent and does what the devil always does from, uh, from when he uh, fell uh, from being one of God's angels. And that is to steal, to destroy, to deceive, to be the father of lies, as Jesus puts it. And he does exactly that here. He seeks seeks to deceive, seeks to sow words of doubt. Listen to Genesis 3, 4 to 5. The serpent says this to the woman, You will not certainly die, for God knows that when you eat uh, from the tree, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God. You'll know good and evil. Words of um, deceit. And suddenly in this God-made paradise, it's like God is being put in the dock. Did God really say that? 
and suddenly there in that beautiful place God is slandered, is misrepresented and all of his goodness and love is questioned. And instead of the boundary that God had put in place being there because he loves them and he cares for them and this is about living in relationship with him, suddenly it's turned into, it's, you know, this is holding us back. Uh, if we eat from this we'll be, we'll be even better, we'll be actually like God. And so the beautiful God is turned into the bad guy, the one stopping you being all you could be and Satan opens the trap. Uh, the kind of trap door for Adam and Eve, and they fall straight into it. But it's interesting as we think about what that is and how that took place, that the devil still does that today. He's still trying to trap us and deceive us and misrepresent uh, God, and we need to be very aware uh, for, for the devil who prowls around looking uh, for people to trap. And as you look into what happened here with Eve, you see that she was deceived by the craftiness of the serpent, by the lies, uh, by actually not following God's words. Um, she, what, the, what the devil says, she doesn't fully correct his wrong words, his lies. She does a little bit, but not fully if you look through the account. And so to the twisting of God's word, she then adds to that her own words, her own thoughts. And in doing this, she moves away from God's word. And once we move away from God's word, the devil knows that he's on the winning line. The word of God is our sword for the fight. It's to always be in our hands. We're to get to know the Word of God so that we can defend ourselves like Jesus in his temptations, defending himself with, uh, with the Word of God. But so we can defend uh, ourselves against the misrepresentation of God by the devil and those who try and use uh, things against us that uh, are around us. So to go back to Eve, the serpent tries to make what is a dire situation kind of much more appealing. You won't die, you know, have a little bit of the fruit, you'll be like God. You can kind of imagine the conversation. And so into Eve's mind was planted doubt, false promises, wrong views of God. So instead of living and enjoying God's best, instead of living as God's masterpiece, instead of living as God's image bearer, instead of beauty and glory I could go on, they fall into sin and they're thrown out in the end of that beautiful relationship in that beautiful garden. God gave us abundant life but we fell because we thought we could be more free if we were in control, if we decided the boundaries, if we did it our way. And so to God's call in the garden, where are you, comes two guilty and fearful people. And we have the man blaming the woman and the woman blaming the serpent. And as the joke goes, the serpent didn't have a leg to stand on. But instead of walking with God in the garden, there enters separation, and nakedness and shame and guilt and so much, and a desire actually to flee from God's presence, to hide away from him. And so instead of letting God be God, instead of following his word, what happened is we tried to become like God. Instead of uh, following the loving creator, we think doing things our own way would be better. And it, just to emphasize that again, it, it looks so similar, doesn't it, to the world in which we live today. I did it my way, still rings loud and clear. But sin has changed everything. Sin affects our whole lives, uh, our will, our mind, our understanding, our emotions, our speech, our behaviour, social interaction, the environment in which we live. I'm here in front of lots of brambles and weeds um, because of the fall. All of that came at that point. And what the Bible teaches is that the fall into sin affected everyone. From that point on, we're now all slaves to sin. We are all unrighteous. Instead of being God glorifiers, we are born sinful, self-centered, fallen. 
So instead of living hand in hand with God, that picture from the garden, we have sickness and disease and war and disappointment and death and pain and tears and depression and anxiety and failure and broken relationships. I could go on. Romans 5 verse 19 says, Through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners. Romans 3 verse 10, There is no one righteous, not one. Adam was our representative. And all members of the human race were represented in Adam. And as Adam sinned, God counted all of us guilty, as well as Adam. As Psalm 51 verse 5 says, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Psalm 58 verse 3, Even from birth the wicked go astray, from the womb they are wayward, spreading lies. If we were put in the garden, the likelihood is, if we were tempted like Adam and Eve, we would fall too. Oops, sorry about that, a fly flew in my ear. But what a mess. From walking in beauty, there's now toil and thorns. From beautiful harmony, there's broken relationships, pain, disease, judgment and death. And as much as Adam and Eve argue about who's to blame, the reality is, is that we're all to blame. We're all sinners. We're all fallen short. We're all in need of a saviour, of one born by the Holy Spirit, born perfect, to live a perfect life and die for us. But that's another talk. Or is it? Because in three, Genesis 3 verse 15, there's a promise. And what's seen as the first promise of the cross of Christ is in Genesis 3. The message translation puts it like this. God told the serpent, because you've done this, you're cursed. Cursed beyond all cattle and wild animals. Cursed to slink on your belly and eat dirt all your life. I'm declaring war between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He'll wound your head, you will wound his heel. So Jesus would strike the devil's head and that's what took place on the cross. He would defeat the power of the evil one, defeat sin and bring freedom. And that victory will one day be seen in all its fullness when the devil is finally overthrown and all of his agents too. So Genesis 3 is an incredibly important chapter in our understanding of God and ourselves but we would actually never understand why our world is the way it is without it. The view of humanity that we see here is also so true to what we see uh, around us today. That we are selfish, that we are seek, that so many seek to be like God, that we mess about with God's word, and we wonder why things are the way they are. But as we thought at the beginning, unless we look at ourselves after first looking at God and seeing God's perspective, we will never have the right perspective. We will never see things the right way round. And my hope and prayer is that we would do exactly that. Lots more that could be said, but I'm going to finish with a prayer. Father, forgive us. We know we are sinners, that we are saved by grace. We know we're lost and fallen, and without Jesus there's no way back. Thank you for the promise that's here in Genesis 3 of a saviour that would come for us. So thank you that you haven't left us outside relationship with you without a way back, but that you provided a lamb, a perfect spotless lamb, and we worship you. Lord, would you help us to seek your face, help us to live for your glory, help us to live in the light of your word. May we not go our own way, but always seek to follow you every day of our lives. And Lord, would you lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for watching, and uh, this series will continue uh, in a couple of weeks' time.